My dudes. My dudes. Dude. What's going on? How's it going? Yeah? Yeah, is your dog being good? Yeah? Yeah, with all those those puppies? Yeah? How's, how's social distancing going? I bet it's been a lot of fun for everyone. Yay, COVID-19. So bad that now you've resorted to listening to me because you're going slowly into cabin fever and need something to distract yourself no matter how bored you might come out to be. So anyway, going to be looking into a different song. This time it's going to be Hallelujah, originally written by Leonard Cohen. It's going to be a fun one because... Uh, there's a lot that goes into this song. I'm going to be going over six variations of the song. The original album version, Leonard Cohen. Jeff Buckley's album version. Rufus Wainwright. That's a well-known one after Shrek in 2001. Even though it was sung by someone else in the movie. Be that as it may. Looking at a live version of Rufus Wainwright. Jeff Buckley. And um, Leonard Cohen. The guy who wrote it and I'm blanking on. It's pretty cool. So, I know there's a lot of different versions of the song. I wanted to focus on three different artists and how they interpret it. There's been a lot of interpretations. I know Bob Dylan did a performance in 1988, two of them, in fact, of that song. You've had Bono, you've had bands. I know freaking uh, Pentatonix did a Christmas version of it. Uh, I, I hate that version. They're talented people, but I hate that version. I'll go, I'll go into that later. So, just about Leonard Cohen, a little bit himself. I, I want to actually get one thing clear about this song. People will tell you with the name Hallelujah, must be a Christian or some form of, form of religious song. Let me make it clear, right now, this is not a religious song. Again, this is not a religious song, to the point where... Leonard Cohen admittedly said it should be considered secular hallelujah. So, what does that mean? I'll go into that. Don't worry about it. But again, this is not a religious song. In fact, it uses religious imagery, some sort of symbolism, some irony. Um, it has a lot of sexual undertones that you might not get right off the bat, but that's why I'm here. I want to... I want to look at those lyrics with you. I want to interpret them. Now, again, interpretations aren't right or wrong. There are variations in interpretation. Good, better, best. If mine isn't good enough, tell me how it could be better. And hopefully we can get the best interpretation. You better argue it, though. Better fucking argue it. Anyway. So, the word hallelujah in the song, it's not to represent God so much as it's to represent a concept of love that has gone rotten or sour. And you get that. You get that feeling in the lyrics and also how the song, the variations in tone, really exemplify that. So again, I want to start with Leonard Cohen. If you haven't listened to Leonard Cohen's version, do it. I have a playlist provided below. It's divided into six different parts. Don't worry, it's not going to be one long video. You're welcome. Uh, but take a listen to Leonard Cohen's original album version. Come back to this video and let's have a good, pr pretty good time. And if you're back, to, just to continue, so Leonard Cohen did grow up Jewish, um, and he does claim to... So there's a lot of Old Testament references made in this song. Um, hopefully it's not porn that's up. It's a lot of a lot of New Testament references that are made in the song. Um, and Leonard Cohen does claim to have a relationship with God, but it's a very complicated relationship. So that kind of affirms to me that this song isn't meant to be religious in any way. Um though it does have religious representation in how it uses the word hallelujah. So, Leonard Cohen had about 80 different um, verses for this song, and it took him about five years to write. And when he got into the studio, he narrowed it down to four verses. And he was actually praised by Bob Dylan, especially for his last line. So, another interesting thing is that I can say, I don't know if this is true, but I think Leonard Cohen had a lot of influence in this song from Bob Dylan. Some of the singing kind of makes me feel uncomfortable in this this version of the song. And it's meant to. Like That's, exa that's exactly what it's meant to do. Um, from the beginning to the end, it's meant to sound more pleasant. Where in the middle, it sounds a little bit more off. Especially on the tones. And here we go and doing alleluia. 
It's like Bob Dylan. Like, how does it feel? Oh, how does it feel? That being said, I love Bob Dylan, but his singing is crap. So actually, another interesting fact, Leonard Cohen actually gave Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, he presented the Nobel Peace Prize to Bob Dylan um, in literature and for his music and it being a controversy. And he claimed that it was the equivalent of giving an award to Mount Everest for being the tallest mountain, which is meant to be a praise, not a criticism, but more of Bob Dylan as such a high figure in what he was able to do with music at the time. So, to the song. You'll notice immediately with the song, it's an accompaniment. In the versions that we're going to be looking at later, it's not an accompaniment um, until Cohen's live version, but Jeff Buckley and Rufus Wainwright, they use... Uh, they play an instrument and they also present vocals, which is an instrument, but it's just one artist presenting everything, as opposed to this, where he, Leonard Cohen has drums and he has background singers, choral singers, in fact. And then later he's going to have a church piano in his live version. It's, it's, really, it's really cool. It's really, it's really good. I like it. <laughs> so, from the beginning of the song, you'll notice the lyrics and it's referencing King David and his composition for God, um, music composition for God. So it says that, that now I've heard a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. And then he references the person, that probably the person that he fell in love with. But you don't really care for music, do you? So the thing with the songs and the variations that you'll hear is Leonard Cohen deliberately goes for more of a bass, um, almost baritone point. Uh, Rufus Wainwright and Jeff Buckley, they're an octave higher than what Leonard Cohen goes for. Um, so, but you don't really care for music, do you? So it's speaking to a former lover. This is my interpretation. I think he's speaking to a former lover um, that he's become disenfranchised with, that his love for had been gone or soured. Now, I like this, the third uh, lines four, five, and six of the first verse. Um, so you can see the vocals and the notation are pretty spot on. So what I wrote down is it shows the chords and how they're going to line up with the lyrics for the rest of the song. And it's going to set up variations for later verses. Um, verse one and verse four, they're going to match themselves. I should also mention with each of the verses in each future song that you're going to be listening to, uh, Jeff Buckley and Rufus Wainwright, they use different verses for their versions of the song. Or um, they add on to certain versions. They don't use the verse that Leonard, verse 4 that Leonard Cohen uses. Um, but again, 4, 5, and 6, it sets up the variations. Excuse me. It sets up the, the chords and how they match the lyrics and how it's going to be incorporated into the song. So you have the setup for the whole song right off the bat, but not to mention lines four, five, and six. It's using hallelujah at its form that it's recognized at, as basically that's popularized at. Um, hallelujah being that true form of love where it's essentially a form of worship and it's correlating it with God in, in this point. And at the time, if you don't know the story of David, I just learned about it <laughs> through this song. I'm not a religious person by any means. Um, but... This is the beginning of King David and his eventual downfall. And this is him, it says the baffled king composing hallelujah. And it, show, it says that King David, the person I've been talking to, is baffled at this composition that he's made because he didn't figure out this form of love or um, that he can create a composition that represents this form of love. In this sense, it's a godly love. Um, that's the reference to the Old Testament. What Leonard Cohen is talking about is love as probably you or I would recognize it, is being in love with someone to the point where you essentially worship them. Um, you think about them all the time. You praise them. You want to do everything for them. It's this big idealization of what love is. You're going to notice from the later verses that that varies, especially in contrast, in juxtaposition, contrast, whatever. We'll say contrast with the lyrics. Um, but though after verse 1, you'll hear the church choir in the background, and 
think Leonard Cohen's in it in this version. I have to double check. But you hear the church choir in the background doing the hallelujah, hallelujah. It's still each verse in the chorus. So as the verses change, the chorus remains the same. And the chorus is representing that idealization of love and what hallelujah represents. But then you get to verse two, and this is where a lot of people are really confused. So the first three lines, your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. Now, this is a further reference to King David in the Old Testament um, when he fell in love with uh, Bathsheba. That's, I think that's how her name is pronounced. Um, and King David had her husband murdered so that he could wed her and uh, sleep with her. And in doing so, he felt immense guilt for what he did, especially with when um, getting with a woman who was already married. So, this is also where Leonard Cohen kind of kind of messes with the notation. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Like it's very Bob Dylan esque, like a low Bob Dylan. Then you get to lines four, five, and six of the second verse. It's like, she tied you. She tied you to a kitchen chair. She broke your throne. She cut your hair, and from your lips she drew the hallelujah. So you notice he says hallelujah a little bit different. So this is the singer's interpretation. But those lines right there are in reference to Delilah and Samson. Um, that story in the Old Testament is when Samson fell in love with a girl. Um, of an enemy of an enemy of the Israelis, I think, um, named Delilah. And Samson had superhuman strength, and her job was to manipulate Samson and figure out where that strength come came from. Now Samson was blessed by God, and Samson's hair, the longer it grew, the more the, the stronger he got. He had superhuman strength. So Delilah figured out that uh, got him to admit that's where his superhuman strength came from. And she tied him to a chair and cut off his hair. Stupid rhyme. Accidental rhymes. So that's where that comes from. But that's a whole other thing. It's the narrator, or in this case, Leonard Cohen, basically saying, yeah, I was manipulated. The person didn't love me the way that I loved her. Because Samson fell insanely in love with Delilah. Then you have the chorus, um, just the same as the first chorus that I told you about. And then verse 3, so you say I took the name in vain, I don't even know the name. I'm assuming that's for hallelujah, or in this case, probably on a more vague term, love. But if I did, well really, what's it to you? So basically saying, like, well, you didn't feel this way about me, what do you care? And it says... There's a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter what you heard. The holy or the broken. Hallelujah. So, as I say in a lot of my videos, I like that. <laughs> Especially the very last sentence of verse 3. Um, but basically what he's saying is when there's a light... Ah, Belch is disgusting. There's a blaze of light in every word, meaning that there's always something behind what's being said. If you say I love you to someone, perhaps one of it is in the holy sense, or you truly love that person to the point of worship, or the broken sense, where you're disenfranchised with what you had. There's still a semblance of it there, but it's not at a sense of where it was, where it was something worth worshiping, but rather it's something to the point of resentment. So, and he juxtaposes it with the word holy or broken. So yeah, those are the words that I was mainly referencing. So how you felt in the past or how you feel now as holy, that is the most pure form of hallelujah. And then the broken. Now I like the word broken. In later variations, he uses the word lonely, which is good too, but the word broken, the consonant with the k, it has a lot of emphasis, the, the, the holy or the broken, hallelujah. 
that sound like Elvis Presley. I, I don't I don't have Leonard Cohen's version in my head like I do Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, so it, it also acknowledges that there's a pure form of love, um, but love can also be tainted. So you have the chorus again, the church choir in the background, and verse four. Uh, again, this is where I mentioned Bob Dylan. This was one of his favorite verses of the song. Um, and the verse that he uses is, I did my best. It wasn't much. I couldn't feel. So I tried to touch. So I did my best. It wasn't much. Maybe he saw the same person. He had love for that person at one point, but the love just isn't there. I tried my best, but that's eh, not enough. Um, and I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. So I like that. Um, damn, I said that a lot now that my friends pointed that out to me. Damn it. So I like that a lot. <laughs> so rather than making himself susceptible to an emotion, there's a lustful connotation right behind it. And that connotation is try to try to touch. So it's very sexual in that wording. It says, I've told the truth. I didn't come to fool ya. Fool ya. It's interesting, the different artists and whether they do the, the ya or the you. But in this case, it's ya. And even though it all went wrong, so maybe the former lover, it all went wrong. I stand before the Lord of Song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. So this is the notation and the the way it's split apart. It exactly, it is a reflection of that first verse. So that version of hallelujah is going back to that purity there. Now, What's the Lord of Song? This can be debated on whether or not this would make this a song of worship or religious. Or religious, it's still not. It's still not. I hate to tell you this, it's still not. Um, but the Lord of Song and the performer here, I think he's just talking about music and his love for music. It's like a true hallelujah. That passion is something that's worth foregoing, and you can hear that crescendo. This, with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. So it's a direct reflection of the first verse. And it's a really good point. I see why Bob Dylan appreciates that part. Because it shows an appreciation for music. Not so much God. In the sense that a lot of people like to think it does. Um, and then it goes back to hallelujah, hallelujah. But also, there's a, there's a little fade out at the very end. Uh, but you all, uh, let me go back. There's one point where they have the accompaniment keeps going, and then it's just silent for about half a second. Hallelujah. So two beats, and then it goes back to the regular song until there's a fade out at the very end. Now, to be honest, um, of the six that I'm going to be looking at, this is my least favorite version, and that's nothing toward Leonard Cohen. This guy wrote a masterpiece. It's by far his most famous song. And in fact, one of the covers of it is one of my go-tos for um, is one of my go-tos for karaoke. That being said, though this is my least favorite of the six that we're listening to, it's still insurmountably better than many of the of the other variations. So, like I said earlier, I, I can't, I can't the pentatonics one. I I can't. Don't even make me try to review that. I won't. <laughs> I won't. They're a very talented group, but man. They use the lyrics that, they use the verses that Rufus Wainwright and Jeff Buckley use, and it, it's not religious by any means. It's very sexual. Like, it, the song gets a lot more sexual. So, on the notes that I have at the bottom here, you'll see the additional verses. And these are the verses that future artists would use. Um, and pentatonics, man, they use, uh, I don't think they understand the songs. I think they just try to sound pretty. Like the, again, they're they're talented people, but I'm I'm just bitching. <laughs> That's the, that version sucks. It sounds so good in the worst way. <laughs> like like it's so much, so much performance without any emotional representation behind it. It drives me, drives me crazy. Anyway, this is the end of part one. Up next, 
We're going to Jeff Buckley's album version. So in the meantime, I hope to see you very shortly.